So tonight we're going to look at C chord. Tonight we're going to look at six key points about glorifying God. God's call on every human being is that we glorify Him. What do you mean by glorify Him? In other words, okay, in other words, God's calling each of us to show His supreme greatness. How do we do this? We glorify God by knowing Him accurately in our thoughts. You know, the last time I spoke, I talked about God's gift of love. And in there we discussed how this revelation, God is love, is radically changing the way we see God. Yes, amen. That most people have that inaccurate view of God as mean, as hard to get along with, as demanding and critical. But when we realize that God is love, that he's kind, that he's gentle, that he's patient, it changes how we see God, and it changes how we read the Bible. This process of reading the Bible, receiving revelation, gaining new understanding, reading the Bible, gaining new revelation, gaining new understanding, is a continuing process. Reading the Bible one time is not enough for us to fully understand and know God. It's also that we cannot hear just one sermon on faith and have a full understanding of faith. The more revelation of God we see, we receive, the more revelation, ah, the more we read the Bible, the more revelation of God we receive. And as we receive revelation about him, that in our thoughts we more accurately know him and we give him greater glory. God is also calling every human being to enjoy him intensely in our emotions. Didn't know that one, did you? But God wants us to enjoy him. He's not just engaging our minds, He's also seeking to engage our hearts, our wills, and our emotions. And as we increase in our knowledge of who and what God is, we also increase our joy in God. A gloomy, grumpy Christian is one who does not yet have an accurate knowledge of God. Yeah. That was kind of the reaction I had when he had gave it to me to write it down. But a groupy, grumpy. Lord, we're going to do this tonight. A gloomy, grumpy Christian is one who does not have an accurate knowledge of God. As many of you know, I have battled depression. And I've learned that one of the most critical elements for how my day goes is whether or not I got into the Word of the morning with intent of hearing God and seeing God. The days that I don't get in the Word are not good days. The days that I get in the Word and I can check it off my to-do list are better days. But the days that I get in the Word and I want to see God and I'm looking for Him and I'm looking to hear Him, those are good days. It's key what we do. It's key that we spend that time with him and read about him. Our expectancy of meeting with God increases the speed, the amount, and the quality of the revelation we receive from reading the word. God is calling every person to glorify him by reflecting him consistently in our actions. Too often, Christians don't glorify God because our actions don't match up. And people see us and say, if that's the God they represent, I don't want anything to do with him. 
but we've got to accurately know him. We've got to enjoy him in order to reflect him correctly. In other words, by using our minds to grasp his truth, by using our hearts to feel his beauty, and by using our bodies to put his truth and beauty on display in our lives, we glorify God. Now, some of you, I hope, are saying, okay, Mickey, you haven't given me any scriptures yet. Good. I'm glad you're saying that. Because we need to have scriptures. And we're going to start with that. We're starting off looking at the biblical support for our first principle. We exist for its glory. Isaiah 43, 6b through 7 are our main scriptures here. Bringing my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. We were created for God's glory. We are also created to know him. to give God glory by knowing him. The world does not accurately know God. In NIV Romans 1, verses 21, 25, and 28, we're gonna look at these a little bit more closely. For they knew, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Because people refused to glorify God, as God, as the creator, the one who deserves their honor, their respect, and their obedience. Because they refused to acknowledge God, the thinking for what he's done, their thinking became futile. Now futile, I look that word up, it means incapable of producing useful results. Their hearts became unable to recognize the spirit of God. In verse 25, we find out that they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. You've all heard some things about God that you knew were lies, and people believed them. Because they replaced these lies, they took the lies instead of the truth. And then in verse 28, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to attain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. Because the knowledge of God is not valued by man, their minds became depraved, totally incapable of identifying right and wrong. Thinking wrong is right and right is wrong. We see that everywhere in our society these days where Cheating on your spouse, that's just what everyone does. It's the right thing to do. Stealing from your boss, yeah, if you can get away with it, that's good. You know, I can give you a million examples of this thinking coming out in our kids' mouths of what they think is right because that's what they're being taught in their world. We give God glory. Whoa. There we go. We give God glory by enjoying him. Psalms 149, 5 says, Let the godly ones exalt in glory. Let them sing for joy in their beds. Exalt. Exalt means be joyful, rejoice, triumph. Let the godly ones be joyful, rejoice, triumph in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Now, I must admit, I don't always wake up in the morning with joy in my mouth first thing in the morning for God. But, as I'm getting to know him better, as I'm learning who and what he is, that's changing. And I look forward to that day when my revelation of God is such that I know when I wake up in the morning, I can be joyful and excited because I have already triumphed that day. We give God glory by displaying him in all that we do. 
1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whatever you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. What a challenging verse to be given to a teenager by their parents. Go do whatever you want to, dear, but <laughs> just do it all for the glory of God. Kind of puts a crimp. Well, no, that's not accurate. That's old thinking. It corrects their thinking. It gives them directions for their behavior. Hey, thank you, Lord. <laughs> By reading the Bible, we learn how God does things. Jesus lives a life as a man and is our prime example. When we act, talk, do all that we do the way Jesus would have done it, we give glory to God. We've been looking at 1 Corinthians 13 and love is. And we know that God is love. God is kind. God is gentle. When we can read those scriptures and say, Mickey is kind. Mickey is gentle. I am patient. I am long-suffering. Then we know that we know God. 1 John 4, 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is God. God is love. 1 John 4, 16 says, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. I didn't put those two scriptures up. We've been looking at them a lot in our love studies. God's calling on every human being is that we glorify him by knowing him accurately in our thoughts, by enjoying him intensely in our emotions, and by reflecting him consistently in our actions. Seeing God's glory is essential to knowing and enjoying it. If we don't see God accurately, then we can't have an accurate understanding of who he is, and we can't enjoy him. In Matthew 13, the disciples asked Jesus why he spoke in parables, and he replied to them, while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. What he was saying was these people's physical eyes, they see with them, but they don't see with their spiritual eyes. They hear with their physical ears, but they don't hear the true meaning of the words in their hearts. Why don't we see, hear, and understand accurately? Jesus goes on in verse 15 to explain, For the hearts of this people have become dull, with their ears they scarcely hear, they have closed their eyes. Dull means calloused, hard-hearted. These people have become hard-hearted, calloused. They rejected God so long. They have tuned out his voice with their ears they scarcely hear. We've all done it sometime. We've been in a situation where there was an ongoing noise, noise and we just stopped listening to it. And people had just stopped listening to the truth in God's word. They had closed their eyes. Reminds me of a kid who says, no, I don't see that. No, no, I don't see, you know. But that's what people do emotionally in many ways, in our own minds. God shows us things, and we deny them. We don't see them. We refuse to see. This also reminds me of people, especially scientists, that say there is no creator. Every year of my life, there has been one or many scientific discoveries that have pointed to God, that have supported him. I find it astonishing that people don't see I was looking at some quotes the other day, and early in Albert Einstein's career, he had quotes about he didn't believe there was God, and God doesn't exist. And people will bring those out a lot. But then he had a quote later in his life. The more I study science, the more I believe in God. And yet there are those who choose to harden their hearts and close their eyes to the truth of God. We believers can know God's, cannot know God's glory 
If we refuse to read our Bibles and refuse to ask God the questions like, what does that verse mean? What are you saying to me? How do I do that? Paul prayed in Ephesians 1.18 that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened. That the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened so that you will know the hope of his calling or the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Why did he pray this? Because down in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 he tells us the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of God. Our minds have been blinded by the God of this world. And I hit the wrong button, I think. There we go. Okay, let me get the right one. There we go. Okay. That brings us to Thank you. I'm glad you guys are so patient with me. But you all are in love. You are in love because you are patient. Okay. Point three. The first key to seeing God's glory is internal. It is the miracle of the new birth. Jesus said in John 4, 4 and 6, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Believers, have you ever tried to explain a spiritual truth to an unbelieving friend or a relative? Yeah. And they just can't get it. That's because they don't have the spirit inside to understand it. Be patient with it. Don't get frustrated. Just go and pray that they will be born again. Because if you don't have eyes to see, you can't see red and blue. If you don't have ears to hear, you can't hear a high C and a middle C. And they do not have the spiritual eyes and ears with which to see and understand spiritual truths. The Apostle Paul Speaking to believers in 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who commanded the lights to shine out of darkness is shining in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The same God who said, Light be at the beginning of the creation of the world speaks into the core of a person who chooses to believe. That light, that new birth, Create spiritual eyes and ears for them to see and hear and understand. I look across this room and I know most of you. But in case you have not been born again and you want to talk with someone about this, please see Pastor Melissa, Pastor Eric, or myself before you leave today. This is important. Please do not let another day end without the new birth. <coughs> and that brings us to point four. If the first key to seeing God's glory was internal, the new birth, the second key to seeing God's glory is external. We must hear and understand the word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23 says, For you have been born again, not of seed that is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. The new birth does not happen without the word of God. No one is born again who has not had someone 
tell them about God and Jesus. Or they read their bi a Bible somewhere. It does not happen without the Word of God. That instruction, that teaching, does not have to be something formal like this today. It can be casual conversations. In Romans 10, 14, now how shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How can someone call for Jesus if they don't know that Jesus exists? Or they don't believe that he's there? And how can they believe he's there if they've never even heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless there's a preacher who's come to tell them? In Acts 16, 7, and 18, I am sending you to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God. You, dear believer, are being sent. I know. Some of you are thinking, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm not ready. <laughs> I need more information. Well, we find out that this point of seeing God's glory is external is also answering that question of now what? For the new believer, I can now spiritually see and spiritually hear, what do I look at? What do I listen to? There's thousands of questions that a new believer has. Preacher A is telling me this, Preacher B is telling me that. Who do I believe? I'm different on the inside. Things that I used to enjoy, I don't enjoy anymore. What has happened? What's going on? What do I do now that I'm here? The person who has been a believer has a little while to figure out some of these now what questions. But when they get ready to be sent, oh, back up. There we go. When the believer is getting ready to be sent, they have the questions of, how do I get ready? What do I say? The answer to all of these ex questions is an external thing, and it's the Bible. The way we learn who we are in Christ, the way we learn what's going on since the new birth, the way we get ready to go out is in the scriptures. Picking up the reading of the Bible for yourself on a consistent and regular basis is the external key to seeing God's glory. Once you've been born again and you now have the eyes to see with and the ears to hear with, the Bible is where you get that information from. <coughs> it's where God provides the answers of who he is. It is in the Bible that God shows us his sweetness. Psalms 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see, the Lord is good. It's in the Bible that we see how others have enjoyed God. 2 Samuel 6, 14 says, And David danced before the Lord with all his might. It is in the Bible that we learn how to reflect God in our actions. The Bible teaches us what is right and what is wrong. It is in the Bible that we see God's glory. It is in the Bible where we replace Satan's lies with God's truth. It is in the Bible that we learn where we needed to be born again and how to be born again and what that means. It is the Bible that answers our now what questions. It is in the Bible that we verify what someone is speaking or preaching. Is this the truth and the whole truth or not? That brings us to point five. When we are internally awake, to the glory of God, we've been born again, and externally focused on the Word of God, the Bible. We meet God and see Him in His glory. The New American Standard, First Isaiah three twenty one, and God appeared again at Shiloh because the Lord revealed Himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the Word of the Lord. When we read the Bible with the intention of seeing God with the intention of 
hearing God. The Lord reveals himself by his word. And that brings us to point six. Therefore, because of these reasons, we give ourselves to careful, thoughtful reading of God's inspired word. In 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13, for we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, that we may impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. We're going to dig a little bit more into these verses. Some of you are saying, I have read my Bible and I don't understand it. We've all been there. Some of you are saying, I'm dumb and I'm stupid. And that's not true. I want to point that out to you right now. That's a lie of Satan. You are smart and you can understand this. Our biggest problem with not understanding the Bible is that we expect to understand it the same way we understand every other book we read. It says here, the Bible is not understood by human wisdom. Right in here, okay? It's not human wisdom that's going to read it. It's going to understand it for it. <clears throat> But, to glorify the God, I'm going to have to move around, folks. <coughs> we impart these words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. It's the Holy Spirit. If you notice there's a capital S there, that's meaning Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who teaches us the truths that are in the Bible. These are spiritual truths, not human truths. And then we see that it's interpreted by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit interprets, explains what's there for us. The words of the Bible have meaning that contain human wisdom. We look at them and we see Oh, like there's a phrase, spirit of the world. If I ask you in here, what does world mean? Everyone except the baby can tell us. If I ask you, what do the words spirit of the world mean? You can give me answers. But that's just the natural meaning of that words. The That phrase, spirit of the world, also contains spiritual meaning. Most of you have heard it interpreted as meaning Satan. Others, the world system or the way the world thinks. Still others have received the spiritual truths that Adam and Eve fall, how the fall changed all mankind, how it also changed the total world, how that change was first a spiritual change, a change which occurred in the spiritual realm, and how that automatically results in a physical change. Wow. Volumes of truth, spiritual truth, can be contained in very few natural words. The Holy Spirit as a teacher is the one we look to to teach us. When we were children, we asked our parents, why is the sky blue? The answer I got is because it is. But when we asked as children, we really couldn't understand the answer. It took us quite a while longer before we learned about atmosphere, prisms, reflected light, color band, wavelengths, until we learn that sunlight passes through the Earth's atmosphere, is reflected, refracted, and it's the color blue. There's the blue. It's the only one we end up seeing. Talk about an awful lot to understand before you can know why the sky is blue. It seems like it's such a simple question. 
there are times when we ask God simple questions to us. What does this mean? But he has to bring a whole lot of information to us first. There's a lot of revelation he has to give. We've talked a time or two about how the revelation that God is love, how we had to have some revelation of righteousness. We had to have some revelations of the courts of heaven. We had to have some revelation of us as priests. There was other revelations that we as a body needed before we could move forward. You know, we've been praying for a long time about our prayer services, that they just weren't what we wanted. Tonight, we had a great prayer service. I told Pastor Edwards, now we're doing what we should have been doing. But it took revelation. It took time for the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what our problems were, what to do about them, how to correct them, and how to pray. We have to remember that not only does the Holy Spirit have to teach us a lot of things sometimes that we don't know. When I was a child, I did not know that I would need to know about sunlight, atmosphere, refraction, wavelengths. I did not know I would need to know those things to understand the sky is blue. I got frustrated because my daddy said, because it is, because I knew it had to be something different. And we do that with the Holy Spirit, too. We ask him questions thinking they're simple questions. And the answer we get sometimes is no answer at all. It's not because he's not answering. It's because he's trying to give us all the other information we need in order to understand. There's another problem he covers. And that's the lies that we already believe. In order to give us God's truth, he has to first point out that we're believing a lie. To tell us that God is love, he also has to point out to us that God is not mean. God is not indifferent. But for some of us, the struggle to believe that has been tough because we believed in an indifferent God. We believed in a mean God for a long time. It's also because spiritual truth is given to our spirits, not to our minds. And it takes a while for the things that we know in our spirit to move up to our brains. And it takes a while for it to move to our brains, to our actions, to our behaviors. There are several things that my spirit knows. Boy, that's true, that's God, you know, right on. But my mind doesn't necessarily agree with. I had a friend that I was talking to the other night, and then he called this evening just before church. And he's been saying some untrue things about himself for years. I can't. Well, he's recently gotten the revelation that he can and that he wants to, okay? And he can explain to me that he can. He can explain to me that he wants to. And then he starts trying to act on it. And the I can't comes back out of his mouth. He gets some resistance and he turns back to what he's known before. We talk about it. We talk about now he's encountering resistance. He sees and acknowledges that he's encountering resistance. We talk about what you've got to do with resistance is press forward. He acknowledges that you've got to press forward. We talk about, or he tells me, God, I can. And that God says I can, therefore I can. And if God, I, who's greater? Well, greater is he, me, that he that is in me than he that is in the world. I don't know why I'm babbling so tonight. Thank you for your patience. I pray the Holy Spirit speaks to your hearts. Okay? You know, he can tell me what to do and why to do it and how to do it. And I think, yes, he's got it. And then he called again tonight. I can't. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Well, <laughs> When you meet resistance, it's 
Test resistance. You move forward. But I can't. Yes, you can. <laughs> if you let resistance stop you, it will get stronger and it will stop you next time. If you push forward, even if it's just a little bit this time, you will get stronger. I think we maybe have got a millimeter push forward tonight. I pray that I'll stop getting these phone calls, but only when he finally gets that revelation, when he sees that resistance is just resistance. We do this a lot as we are studying the Bible. We get it out and we open it up and we read it, especially when it's King James. And we go, I don't understand that. That makes no sense. That's resistance. <coughs> then we have a choice. We can say, resistance, get behind me. I'm going to keep going. God is responsible for revealing this to me, and he'll do it. Or we can say, I don't understand that. Close our Bibles and go do something else. And the next day, the Holy Spirit will come through and remind us it's time to read our Bible. We'll get resistance. You don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense to you. And we will have the choice. What do we do with that resistance? Will we say, yes, I don't understand, and go do something else, anything but pick up our Bible? Or will we pick up our Bible and read, knowing that God, I may not understand today, but someday you're going to give me enough revelation that I will understand. Or another possible response is to say, God, I want to read your word, but I'm not understanding. Is there something I could do differently? Is there a way I could do it better? And maybe God will remind you of that translation sitting on your shelf that you forgot about. Or he'll tell you about a minister who's teaching on the same scriptures. Or maybe he'll just say, read it one more time. And when you read it one more time, all of a sudden, you understand what you didn't before. We have a promise and an instruction. In 2 Timothy 2, 7, we're told to think over what I say for the Lord will give you understanding and everything. Our instruction is to think it over. It's easy to read that Bible and make it a check mark and then forget about it the rest of the day. There's been many a time when we've come to service and we've listened to the preaching and the teaching and we said, ooh, that was good. And we walked out the door and never thought about it again. And Pastor Melissa, reminds us of this frequently. Yeah, I choose remind instead of harp. Okay. But we're instructed to think about it. When we don't think about it, all we get is that surface level, the easy stuff. But when we go and think about it, we open the door up for the Holy Spirit to reveal truths to us. Maybe there's a truth that I need that you don't need. And there's another one that you need that no one else does. When we go back and think about that study, the Holy Spirit can show us how that truth meets your need and my need and someone else's. We also have a promise in this verse, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. It's a promise. He's going to give me an understanding and everything. It may not be tomorrow. It may take a while. There are things in my life that I'm gaining understanding on in the last year that I had wondered about for years. There's also things in my life that I have got on the spiritual shelf, so to speak. I know I don't have enough information yet to understand them. And there's others that I think I know about it, but God's going to show me more, probably tomorrow. 
and he's going to show me where my thinking is wrong. But he's my teacher. It's his responsibility to teach me. And he says he will. He doesn't lie. It's my responsibility to be available to be taught. To not close up my mind and close up my heart so that I can't hear him and see him and have revealed from him. So, in summary, we are all called to glorify God. Seeing God's glory is essential to being able to glorify him. The eternal, the new birth, is a requirement to see God's glory. It's the first key. External. After we have that new birth, or even to get the new birth, we have to go to the Bible to find God's glory. God doesn't reveal himself separate from his word. I don't know of anyone who lived alone all by themselves on a desert island and one day woke up and said, oh, I believe in God. They all had someone who shared the word with them. I don't know of a Christian yet who's overcome some big problem in their life because they never read the Bible. I do know some that have had a dream about what they read or had gone to a, a teaching and it was about one thing and God revealed something else to them. But it's out of the word that God reveals himself. Every time we learn something new, when we track it back, it was the word. When the eternal, wait, being awake, born again, and the external, focused on God's word, then we meet God and see his glory. We have to be born again so we have spiritual ears and eyes to see with. And then we have to take the time and the focus to look at God's word to see what he has to say. Therefore, we carefully, thoughtfully read the Bible expecting the Holy Spirit to teach us. This teaching itself is an example. A lot of it came from a sermon that John Piper did on YouTube, and his title was Six Reasons to Read the Bible Every Day. My teaching here is very different from his. My PowerPoint slides are almost identical to his. The scriptures are the same, but God gave different revelation to us because we're at different places and because you have different needs than what his audience had. Pray about it. Maybe God will want you to go read this, or hear it, excuse me. Maybe not, but trust the Holy Spirit. He's your teacher. 